Hello, thanks for the opportunity given for me to take you through to the 18 years of my experience of my journey, which really started, uh, you know, I, I could rather say I'm someone who started studying in a government boys high school in Krishnagiri, a small town in Tamil Nadu. And then I played some cricket there and I played close to under 19, under 22, under 25 combined to six for Tamil Nadu and I've been part of some calls too for cricket as well. And I also had a dream of playing for the country and representing India. Doesn't it? Everyone will have the same kind of passion when you really put your pads on. And I was no different. But finally, I came to know that there are a lot of players who are better than me. So I couldn't really get through to that level. What I really wanted to be, the burning passion inside, didn't really take up to the next level. So 1999, I became a qualified umpire in BCCA, thanks to, again, to Tamil Nadu Cricket Association. I had dreams of really making it to the international stage, you know, by stepping into Melbourne, Eden Gardens, and Newlands, Cape Town as an umpire. But unfortunately, even that didn't kick up. I was studying electronics and communication engineering in University of Madras. So the pressure actually was to make sure you need to study well, get a distinction, and then probably try and look for a job and then play cricket but then pursue your umpiring career. But unfortunately, you know what? That's not what exactly is going to work if you have that pressure going on. And then I ended up in a very good uh, IT firm and a very good salary and all these things. But always I wanted to make sure, you know, I want to do something what I am doing, but I, I don't know how exactly I'm going to do that because as a player, unfortunately, I was not up to the market as an umpire. I don't know how to proceed after I got my qualification certificate. So when I was thinking about it, then in 2000, early in 2000, when I saw an article that came up in the Hindu that the Indian cricket team, headed by the coach John Wright, is sitting in a software firm called Phoenix Global Solutions to develop a software tool which is going to help the cricketers really to take their game up and do some strategies for the opponents and other things. Then I thought, look, I've got some cricketing knowledge. I've got this passion. I'm a very good software developer. Why can't I do things of my own? That is the day I started developing my software, apart from working in the software company. And the passion continued there. So that is where once I got my software done, I used to take it to all cricket associations. I take, used to take it to all clubs. I used to take it to all former cricketers to really get the feedbacks, how exactly it was looking. And then luckily, I landed up in the National Cricket Academy where I was living in Bangalore to showcase you know, the software to a few of the coaches who came for the seminars and, of course, the admin manager at that time. So they really got impressed and said that, okay, look, this is really looking good. They said that, can you come and join the National Cricket Academy? I didn't have any second thoughts at all. I said that I'm going to quit my highly paid IT job to join on a contract job for the National Cricket Academy because I knew that now at that age I can take uh, independent de decision of mine to make sure that I can really get a life out of my passions. And then slowly I got a chance to be a part of the Indian under-19 team in a World Cup in 2006, which was held in Colombo and Sri Lanka. So that is what exactly that gave me a break. The struggle for you to convince that there is a place for the laptop in the dressing room that took a while and there was nobody to mentor me or gave me what exactly has to be done in performance analysis to make sure it's going to be an influence in the dressing room. I had no idea to be the software is going to throw you all the statistics and other things. There is much more into it. How are you going to involve data into it? How are you going to get the strategies pertaining to the opposition? How are you decode you know, the weakness of the opponents? How are you going to make sure you come up with some intelligence which is going to improve the performances of your own players and your team? I had no idea. All of a sudden, I got an approach from Indian hockey coach, Mr. Joaquin Carvalho. All of a sudden, I got a call saying that we need you in the Sports Authority of India in Bangalore. I had no idea at all. Why is this gentleman calling me? The moment I stepped down to his room, the one thing he told me is, we want you in the Indian hockey team. I can be very honest with you saying that I had no idea whatsoever about hockey at all. I told him that I have not even seen one match. I don't even know what I can do with the hockey team. He said that I like your brains. I read a lot of articles about you. I want to make sure this is what I need to do from you. So then what happened was I sat with him and he said that tomorrow you're going to come with us. You're going to travel with us. 
with to the Indian hockey team for a Champions Trophy in Germany. I said that it took a while. I said, okay, let, let me think about it. The greatest motivation I got that time is when he left the Indian team, he wrote in his book, I mean, he came up with a book called uh, Indian Summers, where he wrote very clearly about this guy who's a passionate guy, he used to come from an yeah, IT engineer from Bangalore and used to feed me you know, all the knowledge and all these things, which was really, really helpful. I wish to see him one day in international cricket. That was the biggest boost I got. And going back to 2007 with the hockey team, another thing is the coach asked me only one thing. Look, we are giving you an opportunity to serve the nation. The next year, there is an Olympics coming in. We will teach you the game. All I wanted to know is, I want to make sure I take your intelligence, your brains to see that how can this benefit the hockey team? I had no idea. Next day, we are catching the flight from Bangalore to France. In 11 hours, the coach is sitting next to me and he's telling me what has to be done for the software. I'm doing the coding software programming in the flight from Bangalore to France. That is 11 hours. When he landed in France, the software is ready. He took me that particular tournament for me to get used to what hockey is all about. And then finally, we ended up uh, with a bronze medal there. And then we went for the Asia Cup three, four months later, and finally we ended up winning the Asia Cup. So before that, I also developed a software in tennis because I'm always a passionate fan of tennis. So, and then once I developed the software, you know, I put a paper submission to International Tennis Federation saying that this is what the match analysis software can tennis can do and how are you going to decode the opponent strengths and weaknesses and how it can be useful so I got a call from International Tennis Federation saying that, you know, we are more than happy for you to come and give a lecture on your software on September 9, 2007 in UK. But unfortunately, the finals of the Asia Cup between India and Korea that is going to be held up in Chennai was also on September 9. The coach told me only one thing, hockey coach, I'm not going to stop you, but we need you. This is the finals. We need to win the Asia Cup. It's your decision because we're not going to stop your growth. It's for you to decide whether the gold medal for India and the Asia Cup, or you want to just decide going on to present your paper submission in uh, that ITF seminar. Unfortunately, we got knocked out in the finals against England. That's the first time Indian hockey team, unfortunately, didn't make it to the main Olympics in 2008 that was going to be held in Beijing, China. So that was really a heartbreak. And then that is a time IPL came into emergence and Rahul Dravid approached me and asked me, can you join our team? Then all of a sudden, out of a blue moon, then I got a, I got a call from one of the uh, cricket managers, Dr. Musaji from Cricket South Africa, saying that I'm in Bangalore for the ICC Awards function. I just want to have a look at what you can offer. Then I showcased him what I can do. And then he immediately said, look, we are going to give you a contract that is only for six months probation, leading to the World Cup in 2011 in India. And then the first time I'm going to South Africa to be part of the Proteus team, even though I've been there for IPL and Champions League, but this is going to be the first time going to be the Proteus team in South Africa, where the opponents are none other than India. So when I went in there, a lot of people will be asking that how much the data drive performance analysis. So I'm going to showcase you a few of the examples on how influential is your data and how much you really make the data drive performance analysis. So it's either way you need to make sure, you need to make a right marriage between data and your performance analysis skill. It's the first time people felt that India have edge over South Africa. So one of the key factor for them is going to be explosive Virendra Sevak at top of the order. So he's someone who's used to take the game away in a session or two when you allow him to bat close to two or three hours. So when I started analyzing Virendra Sevak, so when I saw the last 1,500 test runs Virendra Sevak has scored. A lot of runs have gone through third man. So my way of doing it, I used to watch the last 2,000 deliveries batted by a batsman patiently. And then I will draw my own strategies of what is going to be the line of attack, what is the field I'm going to set. So when in the strategy meeting, when I said that I want to have a third man for Virendra Sevak, because of the slashes that's going in when I, when I clearly watched his technical flaw, what he has got. Or rather, I should not take it as a technical flaw. That's the technique, what he has got. 
where he tries some slashes from the crease. Most of the balls go through the air in third man. I said, I want a third man. And not many people were really ready to accept that idea because in a test match, when you take the new, brand new ball in South Africa, you would rather want to have another slip or you want to have another attacking, catching position. That's what exactly everyone felt. So I said that this is what it is going to be a catching position. So after a lot of deliberation, finally the captain Graham Smith said, let's, let's try this for the first six hours. Not many people are happy about it, but finally they said that, okay, let's try this for the first six hours. They took one fielder for the leg side. That's from mid on and put him on the third man. He took only three balls. When Dale Stein bowled that particular delivery where he exactly wanted to bowl, leaving the covers out. Third ball, Virender Seva flashes and he becomes the first batsman in test history to get out within two overs, caught at third man. It went straight to Ashim Mamla at short third man. If you can ask me, what exactly is the amount of data drive in this? It's minimal. Because normally when you sit in a meeting, people are going to say, when I say third man is a catching option, a lot of people will come and ask me, can I have his dismissals getting caught at third man? I didn't even have one to show because that is the first time it has happened for him. So this is how you need to interpret data into performance analysis. So when you go for the next stage where I'm going to say how much pivotal role data has played, I can take another example in T20 World Cup 2014 in Bangladesh when we are playing New Zealand in a must-win game because we lost the first game to Sri Lanka. If we lose another game, we are going to be back home to South Africa. So that time, we batted and we scored 170 against New Zealand. And normally when it comes to T20 cricket, there is a lot of data research there when the player really comes in first up. Because in T20, there's going to be a power play, only two fielders outside. And it's after the power play, it's going to be five fielders outside. So the expected players for them, if you see that, is going to be obviously Martin Guptill at the top, Kane Williamson at the top order, and Ross Tyler at the middle order. So if you can see the particular strategy document, what I'm sharing here is it's a pitch map for Ross Tyler with strike rates mentioned. Normally, what we do is what type of yorkers? That's going to be a potent weapon, which everyone knows that's not going to be a rocket. Since what kind of yorker where he struggles based on where he moves on the crease and where he plays his shots? So wide yorker, six stump yorker, fifth stump yorker, straight yorker, feet yorkers. And then what else of the other delivery? When you see, when we particularly saw them, that the good length at five meters, when you bowl at probably well, at the fourth stump or the fifth stump, that is where he yeah, got the least strike rate. The game boiled down where they required 55 runs of seven overs. Kane Williamson batting on 50 and Ross Taylor batting. I don't think there is any rocket sense to say which team has got upper hand on that side. The only thing you need to make sure it's goal good length on a Bangladesh track where it's not much of a bounce. It doesn't allow him to really swing his own. The last ball when it required three runs, you can see Ross Taylor moving outside the Austin. The moment he moves outside the Austin, when you say that it's a fifth stump, good length, okay, what you've got to do is to adjust your length based on that particular distance when he moves on. And that's what Dale Stein did. And that ended in a dot ball again for us to win that particular match and we entered the semi-finals. So this is how the data drives you through. So there are also sometimes where the data also can be tricky. I'm going to take you to another example where when South Africa toured India in 2015, the game started boiling down to the wire where there was a situation where 18 runs required of nine balls and the great Mahindra Singh Dhoni was in strike. So the particular time that when Mahindra Singh Dhoni came on strike, out of the 30 balls he played, he just got one boundary in that innings. And that is the time the last two hours it boiled down to. I took my walkie-talkie to relay the information for the bowling coach who's standing in closer to the player saying that Dhoni doesn't play the lap shot at all. So please keep the fine leg in. And Dale Stain was calling. Dale Stain had the fine leg back. The stat says Dhoni has never played a lap shot until then. That's what the stat backing I've got. So based on the information that gone, when the situation boiled down to 18 of 9 balls, Dale Stain brings the fine leg in and Dhoni plays a lap shot that goes for 4. And the situation all of a sudden becomes 14 of 8 and Dhoni is still there with 8 balls to go. So what do you expect the result when a king finisher like Dhoni is at the scene? Can you blame the data? 
You can't blame the data. Can you blame your analysis? You can't blame the analysis, but that's how sport is. So if you really feel it's data that really drives everything, that is what I want to tell you. You need to drive the data and not let the data influence your analysis. I've been part of Indian hockey team. I've been part of tennis for a while. So when it goes to a team, something like a hockey, it's all even based. I'll be sitting and talk in front of the, uh, there'll be a particular place for people like us to keep our cameras, keep our laptops connected. And then we'll be seeing, we'll be having, we'll be tagging the game where the events are going on. We'll be moving the camera with one of the hands and then we'll be having the walkie-talkie saying that the midfield is open. We need to target there. They're changing their combination. They're having this many forwards and having this many misfields, uh, midfields. This, this guy is moving here. This guy is moving there. So that is completely even based. So that is not really, we are not going to talk about individual player. You're going to talk about the particular events there. How to penetrate the forward? How are you going to uh, attack their midfield? How are you going to break their defense? So those are the things, you know, to really be careful of when it comes to a penalty corner. Okay. If I do a single dummy there, if I do a double dummy there, or if I do a drag flick there, what is the percentage of success of the goalkeeper, opponent goalkeeper when you drag flick? or you shoot straight, or you shoot on right corner, or you shoot on left corner. What is the initial movement? What is he going to do? So how are the guys going to approach you or attack you or defend the particular uh, penalty corner? So when it comes to hockey, it becomes slightly more data-based research because you talk about more as an even-based sport. When it comes to tennis, when I send my research on Roger Federer, he was, he was, he was a king on grass. So, someone like Roger Federer, when you try and keep him six rallies on a grass, particularly the sixth rally is going to come up with a booming winner. So, when he comes with a booming winner at that point of time in 2007, 71 percentage have been forced error. You're forcing him for error. Particularly when you try and approach the net and try and force him to pass so that is where you really force him an error. So these are the kind of things when it comes to tennis, it's going to be a man to man where the data drive is going to be more. When Roger Federer is going to serve 1540, what is the type of serve, most percentage? Whether it's going to be a flat serve, whether it's going to be a kick serve, whether it's going to be down the middle or, or it's going to target the right corner, whatever it is, what is the percentage? Then you tell your opponent to make sure, okay, when he's 1540 down, first serve, what is the percentage of him going for this kind of a serve? Second serve, when the first serve is a fault, what is he going to do? So this becomes a completely data mining sport when it comes to individual sport. So all you got to know is to make sure how are you going to drive this? So if you ever think that completely the performance analysis is data driven, I want to humbly beg to differ, it's not completely data driven at all. So this is how we need to make sure how are you going to get your data influential based on the research what you make. So that is how you make people believe you really make an influence of what you do. It's all about how you use your intelligence, how you intelligently use your data and make sure you can make a life out of it. So this is the inspiration I want to give for people listening to this talk and seriously think about how to put your steps forward and really make a career out of it. And really thank you people for giving me an opportunity on a short burst of going through my 18 year career. Thanks a lot and wishing everyone who's watching this all the very best for your future. Thank you.